In this video, we'll start with a discussion on the theory of the firm. And the theory of the firm um, is uh, heavily important in the construct of microeconomic theory. So typically, before we reach the theory of the firm, we typically understand consumer behavior. And uh, in the theory of the consumer, we know that the goal of a consumer is to be able to maximize their happiness. And mathematically, we denote their happiness as the utility function subject to a budget that they would be endowed with or that they would receive as wages or some or some other source of income. When it comes to the second key economic agent in microeconomics, which is which is the firm, uh, their purpose, uh, the purpose of a firm is to be able to turn inputs. So to be able to turn some of the inputs it has into outputs or uh, some output that would be doled out in the economy. And we call the process by which the firm turns inputs into outputs as production. So the primary process by which, it's, uh, by which a firm transforms inputs into outputs is production in the theory of the firm. And like the theory of the consumer behavior, we want to summarize that main behavior into some mathematical relationship. In this case, what's the relationship between inputs and outputs? How do we summarize that relationship? And we summarize that relationship through the use of something called the production function. So we'll get into that later. Now, uh, in the theory of the consumer, you know that the goal of the consumer is to maximize their happiness, to maximize utility. Uh, and they do that by trying to consume as much goods as they can. So they do that by consuming good X1, X2, and so on. Now, the goal of a firm, okay, quite selfishly, is to be able to reap some economic profit or to be able to maximize the profit that it would have otherwise received or garnered through the production process. And profit, we denote that as some, um, as this Greek letter pi here, so that's profit here. A profit is uh, revenue. So this is revenue. Revenue is also some function of Q. Q is a level of production or a level of output, less cost. So the way we compete for profit in economics is very similar to how you compete profit generally, which is uh, revenue, whatever a firm gains from selling such output, less the cost it uses uh, it used to be able to produce such outputs. And Q here is the output a firm produces, uh, which is some function of inputs. So this is a production function. And in this case, uh, in the course of the videos we'll be having, production is just a function of two inputs. Namely, we have here labor or labor hours, more often than not in the literature and capital or the amount of capital used in dollars or in units of currencies. So a key part of the theory of the firm is that the process of production has some sort of spans that it tries to, that it can operate under. So of course, a firm finds itself in an economic environment wherein it may need to be able to adjust certain parts of its, uh, certain parts of the things that it can control. And part of the things it can control is dependent on how long the production process can last or how long a horizon a firm is looking at. And in the, in the theory of the firm, we typically look at two different horizons. So the first one is a firm's production process may exist in the short run. So if the firm produces in the short run, okay, the the period by which the firm produces is first, it's short enough that the quantity used of at least one input cannot be immediately changed in response to a desired change in output. So what does that mean? There are inputs in production that the firm has no ability to change in the short run. For example, say uh, uh, our firm was a bakery and of course a bakery would entail having ovens and um, people running uh, running the business to be able to produce output, say, some pastries and bread. But in the short run, more often than not, it's not reasonable for a firm, say, to buy a completely new, um, a completely new bake shop or a completely new uh, large-scale oven 
because it would be very impractical in the short run. I.e., there are things that the firm cannot control uh, in the immediate short run by which it has control over how, say, um, the production process would go. So if there are small shocks to the economy, it may be possible that the firm cannot respond to those in the short run. Also, the short run in the, in the short run period, it's not uh, long enough in a manner that technological progress uh, can be altered. So for example, say a firm implores to use some form of new technology, it's not long enough that the new technology has enough influence on a firm's output. So we restrict, uh, in the short run, we restrict the firm's progress to that. And third, it's sufficiently long enough that you can produce something. So even if it's short, it's long enough that the firm can actually produce some output or can dole out something there for the economy. Now, this contrasts a little bit to the long run. Okay, in, in the long run, it's essentially almost the same conditions as the short run, except that we relax the first assumption in that we assume that all inputs of production are variable. So the period is long enough that the firm has some control over what it can use. So for example, if the demand is high, it can, for our bakery example, if the demand is high, it can opt to buy, say, another bake shop, another uh, another high scale or large oven in its production process because the period is long enough that it can make sufficient adjustments to its production process so that it can allocate the inputs to attain a bigger level of output should that be the firm's decision. And just quickly, let's make the distinction between two inputs. So there are two types of inputs um, by use. The first is a variable input. Now, a variable input is an input whose quantity depends on the output produced. So what does that mean? In our bakery example, some variable input could be like flour or like um, uh, something like flour or some input to making bread, uh, flour, salt, pepper, sugar. Those are things that change as production change. For example, if one to produce one uh, loaf of bread, you need, say, uh, one gram of flour. To produce two, you need another gram then you would uh, say you wanted to produce two loaves of bread, you would use two grams of flour. So that quantity of flour use changes as the quantity of your production changes. Now, fixed inputs are quite the opposite in a manner that uh, the input quantity is invariant to output. What does that mean? Say, for example, the target to produce was one loaf of bread. To produce one loaf of bread, you need an oven to produce that bread. To produce two lo loaves of bread, you may need that same oven. So uh, often than not, that oven doesn't, uh, the quantity of that oven doesn't change. It's, um, it's something that's there for a long time and it's relatively fixed, not unless you go really in high, into high-scale production. And uh, whether you produce one uh, loaf of bread or say 100 loaves of bread, you will still need that oven. So that quantity doesn't change. In a sense, the cost, in order for you to uh, to buy the oven, you know that that cost is there whether it's for one loaf of bread or a hundred loaves of bread. So that's a fixed input versus a variable input. Most common fixed input land. So you, of course the bakery, whether it produces one loaf of bread or a hundred loaves of bread, its land is it. It's theirs, right? So moving on. Now as a, again as we said, the behavior of a firm. Okay, in the way that it tries to transform inputs into outputs is uh, summarized mathematically by the production function. And we let Q, so Q, represent the output of a particular good used during a period, uh, produced during a period. We let K be the amount of capital used. And we let L represent the amount of labor input used. And what the firm will try to do is it will try to use the most technically efficient production process. What does that mean? Given whatever L and K the firm has, it will try to produce the most amount of Q in the most technically efficient pot, um, manner possible. But uh, to be more economic, uh, to be a more economic problem, what happens really is that it tries to select the best input combination for production of a targeted level Q, say the firm wants to produce this much, it has this target, 
And of course, that target would depend on the prices of labor and capital. So to employ labor, you have to pay people their wages. And a firm's decision is definitely influenced by whatever uh, wages are prevailing in the market and how much a unit of capital to rent would cost. Other than that, we impose additional assumptions on the production function. The first assumption is that we assume that Q, L, and K are greater than or equal to zero. That is, we more often than not uh, target a positive level of consumption. We can or can't, uh, it's possible that we can or can't use labor, and it's possible that we can or can't use capital. So that's the first one. The second assumption that we have, uh, number two here, is called, uh, we lovingly call this no free lunch, uh, a la Adam Smith. So no free lunch. And that just means that, say you plug in no units of labor and no units of capital, well, it's pretty straightforward that you can't produce anything. That is, there can be no output without any input. So there is no free lunch. You can't just get output from out of nowhere. You need inputs to facilitate that production process to be able to turn inputs into outputs. And the last of these assumptions state that the first order derivatives of the production function with respect to each good. So in this case, we have a two good, uh, a two input production function. So say that's Q is equal to F L K. So F L, we denote this as the marginal, the marginal product of labor and the marginal product of labor is um, the increase okay it is the increase in output for an increase in labor units or labor hours if that's how L is measured holding a capital constant so without changing capital just moving labor upward by a bit how would output change okay and it's straightforward to think that FK is what you call marginal, marginal product, okay, product of capital. And that's basically almost the same as marginal uh, product of labor in a sense that it's the amount that Q, our, our, our output will change given a change in capital, okay, holding uh, labor hours or labor constant. So mathematically, right, mathematically, we denote marginal product of labor as the partial derivative of our production function. So Q, F, L, K with respect to L, in this case, if it's labor, and this is equal to F, L. And then we assume that is greater than zero. That is, uh, output will increase if we increase labor holding capital constant, which makes sense. And then marginal product of capital is the partial of the production function with respect to k, okay, that is again holding L constant, that is fk, which is also greater than zero, which also sort of makes sense because if I increase capital, output would probably increase, well, assuming that I did not change labor, which is by the definition. And those are the initial assumptions.